we would like to invite both our moderator and our guest speaker, Johan and Maverick, on stage. Right. All righty, everybody. Just as I now comes in, let me reiterate. Huan Ying, Slamat Datam. Welcome, beyond venue, from anywhere that you're watching in the world. Our guest today is the king of quality leads, the Shah of sales, okay? He is our special guest for Marketing Mad Science. It's none other than Authority Institute's Maverick Pro. Maverick, how are you doing, man? Hey, uh, okay, with the way you introduced me, I got like, man, 45 minutes to basically live up to that name. So you got to stop over-promising so I can start <laughs> over-delivering in a bit. Okay, man. Okay. Hey, all good, all good. Thanks for having me tonight. Really appreciate it. Right. Okay, okay. Well, just um, for for expectation setting, how about we pull it back a little bit? Um, okay. Some people here may not may not be familiar with uh, you personally or what you do. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the life and times of Maverick Fu from you know your your journey up until what you're doing now. In your own words. Okay. So uh, ex Buddhist monk, college dropout, single dad. So I think those couple of words probably will summarize uh, what I do. I uh, was being called one of the worst salesmen I've uh, the person I've ever met. And uh, I think since then, I've kind of like, propelled myself to focus into marketing. If let's say I'm not good in sales, why not be better at marketing, right? But uh, ironically, 20 years after that statement was made, uh, that company actually became my client. So, uh, well, call it karma, but the person has left the company. So, and uh, so I've, so where I drop out from as, uh, it's always, it's actually an engineering degree. I've always loved mathematics, but I knew I never wanted to become an engineer, but I've always loved psychology. Just that my mom uh, at that time, she thought that, well, uh, what are you going to do when you, you know, studies, you know, because of accountants, you do accounting and, uh, and engineers, you do engineering. If you study psychologists, you work with psychos, is that how it's going to work? So I'm like, okay, damn it. But I think in her infinite wisdom, right, because I was denied studying psychology, I actually got gotten more interested in it. So even back then, probably one of the reasons why I failed uh, college was because most of the time I'm not even in the engineering section. I was I was being curious at how human psychology was. So social psychology is one. Uh, I went on to study uh, organization psychology as well because when, when you're alone, you're bas basically dealing with yourself, which is fine. But when you are dealing with the mass or with a couple of people, right, some of the dynamics change. So even in your case, Johanna, pro probably you have friends who have a certain kind of character when she's with uh, he or she is with you, but in another setting, they will change. So it's always that social dynamics that actually got me interested in. And that, I think, is the reason why a lot of businesses are, are failing to understand. Because in this, mm -hmm. now it's 2021. If we mm -hmm. are always looking at technology, like what's the latest tech out there, we can never catch up to truth be honest, uh, truth be told, because like Friendster, okay, then again, some of you could be too young to remember Friendster. Uh, Friendster used to be like the, the big social media thing. If you're not on Friendster, you're a loser. Uh, and then when Facebook came around, they're like, nah, I know, Facebook sucks, Friendster is awesome, but my son, who's actually 13, probably will never heard of what Friendster is anymore. So, but it doesn't change the fact that human psychology has always been the same. So like, for example, 5,000 years ago, we will wear gold. And uh, that, in a way, with all the blinks, we have communicated our status. But nowadays, we may not wear gold, but we will go to a nice cafe with a nice cafe art, uh, latte art, even though the coffee sucks, but the latte art is awesome. And you take a photo and you share it on social media. Interestingly, the emotional triggers are the same. So 5,000 years before, we could, have, we, we could have demonstrated it in another way. But now we demonstrate another, but the psychology, the part of what we usually call the triple A, you want attention, you want acknowledgement, and you want acceptance. That has mm. haven't changed that much since the last 5,000 or even 10,000 years ago. So if you, in marketers or even entrepreneurs were to start focusing on customer psychology, right, I think they will be a lot more uh, successful in basically bringing their product to market or basically even scaling their business. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, if you had to define marketing very, very simply for, for the people in the room, again, so that everybody's on the same page, what, what does it mean to you? 
Oh, okay. Uh, so a lot of people ask me that question, like what's the difference between sales and marketing? Uh, which is kind of weird because the two functions are totally different. So uh, I think sales is easy to understand because we have all been accustomed to sales. Uh, for me, because being a college dropout, I, I don't like hyper-technical terms that kind of show off how smart you are, but at the same time, it also shows that you don't understand the whole concept, right? So for me, marketing is as simple as making the salesperson's job easier. That's it. So the sales, the, the marketer's job is to make the salesperson's job easier and perhaps one day obsolete as well. And it's possible because like, if you go into Ikea, if you go into Uniqlo, for example, uh, when you shop at some of the uh, newer uh, establishments, you realize that they don't really have a salesperson. You go in, you pick the stuff that you want, uh, maybe you ask a couple of questions uh, and then that's it. So gone were the days where you will walk into a boutique and then a young girl or a young guy will come up to you. Hey, Mr. Johar, uh, they probably won't know you. Hey, Mr. Uh, what are you looking for? Uh, you know, uh, can I show you around stuff like this? And mm -hmm. last time, perhaps you will say, you will see that as good customer service, but now it's the past. It's like, hey, man, I'm an adult. Uh, I know how to choose what clothes I want to wear, you know, just by the wrong. Yeah. So I think customers have actually become more independent as well. So the... So the salesperson's job has actually, in a way, become easier because after the customers have done all the research, then they will go to the salesperson, you see. But the information that is placed in front of the prospect before they make a decision, is not done by the salesperson. It's actually done by the marketer. So the marketer's job is always to make the salesperson's job easier, as simple as it is. So you qualify the prospects. And that is also where um, I realize a lot of businesses may have put on the wrong matrix for the marketer. So they will say, they will go to the marketer or, or the marketing team and say, hey, how many sales did you close this month? That's the wrong question because actually that's the salesperson, uh, the salesperson is responsible to bring the sales. The marketer's job is actually to bring qualified leads or qualified prospects and put it in front of the salesperson. So mm -hmm. the right matrix should be, uh, you know, what's our engagement count like or how many uh, qualified prospects do you put in front? So I guess marketing in many for many entrepreneurs or business owners, especially those who are a bit on the traditional side, if they've been around for the last 20 or 30 years, marketing for them is going out to drink with friends and then networking and building relationships. That's why right. last year was a wake-up call for a lot of them. They realized that, huh, mm. they, they don't know jack shit about marketing because all the while what they do is relationship building. And the moment mm. they are in a lockdown mode where they can't, bring their friends out for drinking mm -hmm. or whatever, the, then they realize that, man, I don't know, they're, they're stuck. Sales suddenly doesn't happen anymore. So I think what COVID has done for it, it has done a lot of bad stuff, uh, but at the same time, it's given us a wake-up call as well that now we truly know what's the real difference between marketing and sales. And before I end this question as well, uh, because some will eventually ask, then Maverick, what's the difference between branding and marketing? So let me just answer because so often I get asked this question and because again, if you ask a branding consultant, they will give you a big dictionary, you know, uh, definition for me, branding as simple as it is, is the story that your customers or your prospects tell about your brand, about your company. What's the story that they tell in their head about you? So for example, Apple. So an Apple user would think that, hey, man, I'm damn stylish. I'm like awesome. Girls are looking at me because I'm using an Apple phone. It's a story they play in their head. And when I take a photo, it looks, it looks nice. The wide angle lens looks nice. So it's a story that they play in their head because in a way, Apple have incepted the idea, have planted the idea inside. And the marketing uh, marketer's job now is to magnify and amplify that story. So that I see testimonials. Yes, I made the correct decision. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I saw Apple winning an award again. Yes, I made the right decision. So the, ma the marketing is always a great ma magnifier, which means that, which also means if your product is shitty, it's gonna just going to magnify a <laughs> shitty product uh, even more. So branding, as simple as it is, what's the? it's not the story that you tell. So a lot mm -hmm. of people get marketing wrong because they will think that, oh, brand story means that what, what am I telling the market? No, it's actually what they are telling about your brand. It's actually the other way around. And then the marketer's job is always just to magnify that story that's already in the head. Right, right, right. Okay. 
the way you describe it, definitely it sounds like a science, right? So <laughs> I think we got the title uh, pretty spot on then. So with, with all of that as, as our context, mm. do you believe that there is actually a formula that people could follow generally for success or rather there are formulas specifically depending on which vertical you're in? What are your thoughts? Okay, you see, the truth is that uh, marketing has become a hell lot more complicated. Like mm. uh, I started marketing 18 years ago, I started with drafting like billboards and newspaper ads. And back mm -hmm. then, they see a flyer, yes, this is what I want, and then they will call. But right now, customers have become a hell lot smarter. Like for example, the moment I see a brand that I've never seen before, I'll take out the mm -hmm. phone and I'll Google, I'll search. And uh, even that itself is an opportunity. So a good example would be you go to... A, a grocery shop and then you saw a shampoo uh, and you wanted to buy a shampoo and, but, but it's a brand that is new and it's like 10 bucks and then you decided uh, your parents will probably just hey man if it's good enough i'll just buy it for 10 bucks it's good enough but most of us today would basically take out our phone do a bit of research hey it's actually available on lazada or shopee you know what let me go and buy it heck it's actually cheaper it's only eight bucks but the minimum order for free delivery is 20 ringgit, 20 bucks, which means that then they will actually spend more. But if you think of it logically, end of the day, you actually wanted that shampoo. At, you could have got it at 10 bucks, but right now you actually end up uh, paying 10 bucks more for stuff you don't need just to justify the free delivery, you see. But that's the, that's the human uh, psychology part because we will always try to justify the purchases that we make. We'll say that, oh, because it's free delivery, that's why I'm, uh, I'm getting a discount. Uh, uh, just now we talk about Apple, so I'll just use that. So when I, I think at one point when you buy an Apple device, they will give you a, a year of subscription to Apple TV for free. So uh, which kind of work up to be like, let's say a thousand bucks per year. Mm -hmm. So at, at month 11, what happened is that the, the Apple user, uh, Apple TV plus user will be like, hmm, do I want to continue? Because if I continue to pay another thousand bucks, but if I top up another, say, 500 bucks, I can get a new iPad mini. And because of that, I get another one more year. So I'm actually saving a thousand bucks. No, you're not. <laughs> you're actually not saving a thousand. You're still spending 1,500. But if you have users for the Apple TV, then maybe it's somewhat justified. But, mm -hmm. but you see, a lot of times we are in a, I think we are in the age of consumerism as well. We just want to collect stuff, even though we don't use it. Like how many subscriptions we have? Like how many... Uh, subscriptions we have to software that we don't use. Sometimes you just comb through and say, oh, actually I bought this software a couple, uh, couple of months ago. I don't even know anymore. But we are in the age of, we just want, we just want stuff, right? So the more subscriptions we have, the better. Netflix promises that, well, you're supposed to have one subscription and you get all your series and all your movies at one flat price every month. But then came Hulu, then came Disney+, Plus, then came mm -hmm. Amazon. Uh, you know, almost everyone has. So right now we need to subscribe to more channels than before because in Malaysia last time is you get three free channels, TV one, TV two, TV three, and TV seven, and then you if you a bit atas you get to go for Astro. But right now on top of Astro we need Netflix, we need Disney Plus, we need all that. So it's actually we are spending more on subscription. And how many? Truth be told, we can't even consume all the content because mm -hmm. you can't watch. To series, I guess uh, I guess uh, maybe a woman can because women can multitask at the same time. Of Men course. just suck at it. Yeah, but uh, but then again, we I I also realized that customers find it even harder to actually commit because if that episode of that new series don't attract me in the first five to five minutes to ten minutes, I know I have so many other options. But I grew up in a day where there's only one channel and. Uh, you can, as much as you want to do a channel surfing, there's only a trip two or three that you can bounce back and forth from, right? But now you can like cycle through a hundred channels and still not decide. So mm -hmm. indecision, indecisiveness would be become would become one of the biggest issues of our generation. But marketers knew about it. Marketers knew that humans have become more and more indecisive. That's why we would encourage you to actually buy a variety of things even though it may not satisfy. So that's where persuasive engineering come in. Uh, if you look at Facebook, you look at Instagram, a lot of times there, there's no end to a timeline. If you just keep on scrolling, there's mm. actually no timeline. 
uh, because you they want you to be addictive to it, the fear of missing out. So I think in a way, marketing has become a science science of psychology. It's not that psychology is new. Psychology has been around for like the longest time. But I think marketers are becoming smarter and smarter to basically, um, I hate to use the word manipulate, to manipulate the human emotion uh, in buying something. So even though they will buy something that they don't need, which is, uh, that's why I did a TED, TEDx talk on this before. Are mar marketers without ethics? Are we actually magicians? Just like what everyone thinks we are. Or we are actually just manipulators of the truth. If we know the packaging look crappy from the front, let's just tweak it to the side and let the customer see the side. Don't, 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 don't see the front. So isn't that to a certain degree manipulation already? And because of that, that's why when we take photos of ourselves, selfies, we will take multiple angles and we choose the best one that we think is good. So, uh, and yeah, I think that opens up a whole can of uh, behavior again, like uh, social empowerment, basically saying things like, hey, you, you, you need to own your voice. Uh, you don't, don't have to be on TV anymore to communicate your thoughts. You can go to Clubhouse, you can go to YouTube and basically say whatever crap you want. And here's the truth, in a small village, in a small village of 100 people, if your views are different uh, than the other 99, you'll be alienated immediately and you'll be suppressed. But when, but because of the internet, every village will have one weirdo. But if all the weirdos can come together, it's a village online. So then you realize that people were, are braver. They become more vocal right now. And then that's how brands like Nike and Adidas come in. It's like, hey, give our customers a voice. That is also a marketing play as well. So we always question the ethics of what we do. It's like, uh, that's why I always respect the companies like Patagonia. Patagonia would actually say that, hey, if your bags or your, uh, you know, your apparels are actually not torn, uh, here, here's a video on how to fix it, which actually doesn't make sense to most Asian businesses. It's like, hey, if the customer's zipper is damaged, uh, they can buy a new one. They can buy a new one from us. That's, that increases the profit. But what Patagonia or what Google does is that, you know, if uh, like I'm using a Google 4, Google Pixel 4, so when uh, Google Pixel 5 is launched, Google will say that, hey, for those of you who are using the previous versions of Google Pixel, uh, just wait a couple of months and we'll roll out the features for you. So that sounds a bit responsible, responsible marketing, because I don't see the other phone brands or other apparel brands like uh, would say something like Patagonia. So where marketing will lead us in the next 5, 10, 20 years, I wouldn't know. But I think if we don't uh, employ some form of ethics to it, right, uh, marketers can actually sway votes. We can sway political votes. We can... Mm -hmm. Uh, make a shitty product really good. So you are right to call it a science. And as more and more marketers learn that science, what's governing us? That's always the question that, uh, you know, that there would totally be a sequel to this particular startup grind that we're having. So we better put a cock on it and uh, go back to the main question that you asked just now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, since we did say that pandemic has really brought digital into the forefront, right? And even in yeah. Malaysia, it's been no exception. Like our, yeah. our government has been pushing digital marketing as one of the easy to learn pickup skills. And right now we see actually quite a few pandemic born digital marketers, right? And yeah. how how do you think um, this, this influx of knowledge about digital marketing into the community at large is affecting the dynamics of the experienced marketers, B2B relationships, and so on? Uh, okay, I would think that just like how, uh, like our parents' time, they can totally be excused if they don't know how to use Microsoft Word or mm. Google Docs because mm -hmm. they are you know, retiring and it's not needed. They, they can retire with a typewriter and that, that will yeah. still work. Uh, but in our generation, I think uh, if kids grew up not knowing how to use like Canva or some form of graphic design, you, you may not need to learn how to use Adobe Illustrator. But if you know how to use Canva, that's good enough. Or you, you need to know how to do some photo edits. And I think digital marketing would be one of the essential skills as well. Uh, I, I could be biased, but let, uh, hear me out. You see, if a graduate, uh, even if a student wants to get a job, he goes, he can uh, basically knock on doors the traditional mm -hmm. way, 
or he go to LinkedIn and basically spice up his or her profile and make it look damn good with nice visuals and nice photos and nice copywriting. So copywriting in a way falls under marketing as well. So, you know, again, and uh, below average in terms of ability graduate, a uh, below average uh, graduate can actually outperform or even outshine a, a really good student if he or she know how to do marketing a lot better or digital marketing a lot better. Because right now, the HR manager, for example, before I, before I hire you, Johan, I'm going to take out the phone. I'm going to Google you first, whether you are a creep or you're a stalker or what kind of person you are. If I can somehow engineer the results that come out by showing things that what the HR, com HR person wants. So I think uh, that's even better. So to, to actually answer your question, digital marketing has become a skill. It has become a tool. Uh, where experienced marketers like us come in is our understanding of the market. So digital marketers may have, it's like me giving you a sword. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether you know how to use it or not, that's another thing because the greatest Kung Fu masters will basically beat you up without even taking out the sword. So, it, so because they have experience, right? So I think where digital marketers that were born last year, uh, pandemic born, uh, I don't think they are necessarily taking away the jobs of uh, experienced marketers uh, because they will still need some time to basically catch up. But having said that, experienced marketers will need to learn the fundamentals of digital marketing, like remarketing, retargeting, mm -hmm. uh, these tools, uh, like how funnel work and all that. They may not need to learn how to build click funnel pages, but mm -hmm. they must know click funnel exists. They must know how drip campaigns work. They must know all the matrix as well. So I think it will be quite exciting time in marketing because you have the, the original generation. Uh, well, people call me OG because I started with newspaper ads, right? So, and then you have the new ones and then now we are blending it together. So how we use the weapons or how the, late, uh, the new digital marketers use the weapons would determine the next couple of years. But, the, but I do realize that due to the lack of business acumen, a lot of mm. digital marketers are throwing price. It's like, hey, yes. uh, you know, it used to be you can charge like five grand a month to do digital mm. marketing. Now you have, you have people who are, hey, Johan, you know what? I'll do it for free. You just pay the, uh, <laughs> the X money. And I'm like, uh, I, I think in their, in their objective, uh, I think uh, th that's where the, the lack of strategy comes in, you see. So they end up doing a lot of free stuff and they, in the process, they actually spoil the market as well, not just for themselves, but for the others, you see. So then uh, because of their lack of competency or their, uh, they are competent in running ads, but perhaps they may lack the skills in the overall uh, strategy. Digital marketing end of the day is just one of the weapons. You still need a whole armory of different type of weapons to make it work. So to say that, oh, I just know uh, Facebook ads, I think it's good enough. Uh, that's just top of the funnel. Like the moment someone subscribes to your lead magnet, you kind of need to nurture it. Uh, then you need email marketing as well. And for that, mm -hmm. you need some form of content marketing and copywriting skills. So I think digital marketers will need to continue to laterally upskill uh, themselves so that they know uh, a broader set of weapons, lah, so to speak. You, you don't see Batman going to every villain just using the better rank because it will be damn easy <laughs> for Dr. Freeze or the Joker to like, oh, you know what, this Batman, the moment he comes out, he's just going to take a better rank. We're just going to watch out for it. But Batman will basically analyze the situation. And sometimes he can do everything without even his utility belt, right? So I think the versatility uh, is something that perhaps the digital marketers will need to be equipped, uh, need to be equipped with. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, I'm glad we already addressed the idea of maybe the influx of digital marketers kind of warping the price, right? But then one of the other things I noticed is since there was an influx of digital marketers, uh, we see that some of the jobs being advertised by bigger companies as well shifted from just regular marketing to a bit more of looking for growth marketers. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that... Um, there is a difference between the skill set of a regular marketer and someone that specializes in growth marketing. It's true. Uh, okay, in that case, like uh, uh, Paul Graham from uh, from Y Combinator, 
I, I think he did. I, I think some time ago he mentioned this before. So he was saying that basically he, uh, I, I could be wrong, but he did mention stuff like growth, uh, growth hackers or growth marketers in a way. Uh, it's just a bullshit term because at the end of the day, it's just you're just analyzing multiple channels and see which one works the best and you double down, right? So uh, it's more like common sense. Uh, but of course, you can't call it common sense marketing because that doesn't sound sexy. Uh, growth marketing sounds a lot better. But of course, growth marketing, uh, they, they play around with a lot of experimentation. So uh, if you ask me, there's not much difference uh, between a a real good marketer and a growth marketer because a real marketer in, mm. in their blood, they are naturally curious. They will ask, hey, Johan, why are you wearing a red jacket? Like you, you have any other color, but, what, but why red? So they are naturally curious. And if they bring their curiosity to split testing, A-B test or A-B-X test, and they, they, they love to look at the data and, hey, can you compute the report so they can see if, because if the curiosity is there indirectly, they have one element of being a growth uh, marketer. Because growth marketer is just very much focused on like perhaps a couple of uh, metrics and just double down on what's working, right? So like I said, common sense. Uh, but whereas a lot of, there are a lot of marketers out there who basically do billboards and, you know, uh, above the line kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I, well, technically they are marketers as well. As you said, the tools that they use are different, but th those are very broad. Like if you run the billboard ads, it boosts visibility. Uh, but mm. does it generate leads? Not necessarily, because it may need to... Uh, a good one that uh, Grab did, so when when Grab first, uh, when they changed from My Taxi to Grab, so they, they took a billboard that says that My Taxi is now known as Grab. Okay, uh, on a... Uh, if you take two or three steps back, you will realize mm. that that billboard doesn't do much other than pure visibility, because if I'm already a My Taxi user, Frankly, you don't need me, you don't need to put out a billboard to tell me. Just drop me an SMS or email and let me know to download the new app. That's that's good enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I'm not using my taxi before, changing it to Grab, it's not going to make me download want, want to download the app anyway. You're just changing the name. I don't care if you call it ABC My Grandma. I don't even care if, if my name is there. I, I won't download the app if I won't use using it before. So that one is a visibility app. Nothing wrong with it. And then after that, one month later, so I think it launched in KL, but I don't know whether it launched in other parts of uh, Malaysia. So what they, they say is that, hey, uh, flat rate of 65 ringgit anywhere in Klang Valley to the airport. So anywhere, regardless of where you are, if you take a Grab ride, it's a flat price of 65 ringgit. Don't care, the ride take four hours. If flash mm. flood, it's going to be flat 65. Okay, that one is a good lead generator because I would immediately take out the phone and like, Heck, man, 65 bucks, that's hell of a good price. I'm going to download the app. And that's how, uh, so that's the difference between two build, uh, two billboard directions, okay? But the medium is the same, but the message and the strategy is different. So, uh, of course, I'm not saying that Grab did the wrong strategy with the My Taxi. It's not known as Grab, but it's a visibility play. Every time when there's a logo change, larger companies will take a big ass ad just to tell that, hey, our logo is from here to here. And most of the time, consumers may not even notice it, but it's purely for visibility sake. Yeah, so so that's where the, I think digital marketing where to come into, uh, have to merge with uh, what the previous marketing channels were, because mm -hmm. there are still certain experiences. Like just now you mentioned B2B as well. B2B marketing uh, is very much different from yeah. B2C or even B2G, for example. Uh, uh, I think if we just call it digital marketing, it's, a, it's sad because end of the day, human beings, we are still pretty much analog creatures. So I think hybrid marketing or at least omni-channel marketing is actually more appropriate uh, moving forward because like, I still appreciate companies who send me a birthday card. Like they could have sent me an e-card, which is digital, right? But if they sent me a physical card and like, wow, they actually took some effort into writing my name. Or, uh, and hand, handwritten notes is going to be such a big thing because I think most kids nowadays may not know how to write anymore. So, yeah, which is another, uh, which, which is really weird because I'm 39 this year. And looking back in the last 40 years, right, so much have changed. Like when my son first started using a laptop, he was struggling with the mouse because he, he came up wanting to touch the screen because he, he grew up in a touch-centric uh, mm. environment. 
And I'm like, you know, screw it. Lah. If you don't know how to use a mouse, it's your loss. But then I realized that the moment I start using a Mac, I don't even use a mouse as well. So that's how much technology has shifted within <laughs> one, one short span of 10 years. Like Iron Man just came out in 2008. There was a year, the birth of Airbnb as well. And the birth of the iPad was actually launched in 2008. But fast forward to today, like 12, 12 years in, we have the Marvel Cinema, Cinematic Universe. We have DC trying to do their best. And then we have like iPads that are like, uh, like it's, a, it's, it's staple. And uh, truth be told, iPad is not the first tablet out anyway. But if you yeah. look at it, even a non-iPad tablet is now registered as an iPad, just like how we used to say uh, Pampers as diapers and chocolate drink as Milo. So we always have that kind of association. So if uh, that kind of association will still work until today. So it's just that right now we have more digital frontage to basically cover. Uh, I think businesses have to have a harder time. Now, if you ask me, last time it's just a newspaper, which is a lot easier to capture someone's attention. <laughs> but now is, I think there's 198 uh, social media platforms in the world right now, which mm -hmm. is, yeah, you can't be on everyone to be told. Uh, true people. Yeah. So with that, with so many, digital channels right like there there must there must be a ton of red flags that just marketers need to watch out for right what in your opinion what are the biggest ones that people should watch out for when they're thinking about doing marketing? you see like uh, a lot of times people will go to what is popular so like facebook right now is really popular so but then again uh so so in all uh okay anyone from facebook listening in i'm sorry but this is basically observation as well so at the start of anything right uh if you look at uh, any form of uh technology as uh, uh, even any form of uh anything that's new at the start that there, there's always a stage of uh, fringe fringe means that uh, like facebook started in harvard if you're not a harvard student you couldn't use it and stuff like so so it was very fringe it was very exclusive and then uh then then basically the build-up starts and whatnot and then after that they will reach a stage of familiarity where everyone will basically say that, hey, if you're not on Facebook, you're a loser and stuff. So because familiar, they become mainstream. And then, but I think right now, Facebook is actually in a stage of fascism. Like if you talk to enough digital marketers, they will basically say that, hey man, our ads got banned again today. Our uh, our ad accounts got banned again. So they are, they are really putting in rules. Uh, whereas maybe three to five years ago, uh, heck man, you want to advertise Bitcoin, you want to advertise everything is fine like but right now there are more and more rules so in any social media that comes up so when clubhouse started last year it, they were actually in the fringe area because only ios users if you're not an ios user you uh you, you don't get to use it and that, uh, that creates a form of like exclusivity uh, mm -hmm. then after that uh, it became more familiar so eventually uh of course clubhouse started in a way that they say hey there's no censorship you can say whatever you want but if you look at this scale, right, there could be a day where whatever you say would actually be censored as well. Because all societies in the world uh, at first always started with uh, exclusivity. And then after that, they will become, hey, this one is common right now. Actually, if you look at religion, it's the same as well. So uh, religion started off as a, as a fringe. And then if you study history, and after that, it become mainstream. Oh, are you a Buddhist? Are you a Christian? Are you a what? And then after that, the rules start coming in uh that's why i always say if ever you want to become a good marketer study religion because no product has actually lasted as long across different generations across different uh cultures across uh, like uh, how it's been passed down across and how it spreads if you study it as a product or as a service you will learn tons about marketing uh uh, because truth be told, no marketing, uh, I mean, no product has actually lasted as long. It's the same as well. If you study all history of uh, religion, they will have gone through these three stages over here. So when you start that time, if let's say you are starting off, uh, starting a new religion, you'll be ostracized first. So you need to start building your little communities and stuff. Right? That's where the fringe uh, starts, right? Move, movement. And then it becomes, if you're not a Christian, you... You lose, for example. If you're not a Buddhist, you are a bad person. So that's where uh, familiarity comes in. 
And then after that, because it has become such a messy thought of, you know, whatever that everyone wants to come, everyone's already in there. That's where rules have to come in. So I think for those new to marketing, actually, even those who are experienced, it's always this thing that they need to always uh, kind of like uh, focus on. Uh, I think the path forward always lies in by studying history because human, they say history repeats itself, right? Uh, in different forms, uh, but human nature has, not change that much to be honest Ten thousand years ago if i saw a bush shake in front of me and an animal like a creature jumps out if the creature run after me i will run away instinctively even until today i will do that but if the creature were to looks cute and runs away from me deep down i'm like hey why is that let me go closer and look at it so even right now, if that's why retail marketer, retail marketers are doing it wrong because sometimes they will approach a stranger. Hey, mister, hey, mister, come, 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 give you a brochure, give you a brochure. And you're like, okay, okay, take and you go away because you, you are like, who, who the heck is this guy? Never seen the brand before. <laughs> you're just going to take the flyer and you throw, right? So, but if let's say they were to say, hey, we got a, a little sample, Prinkles, horrendously good at it. It's like, hey, we just came up with a new flavor of potato mm -hmm. cheese. Would you like to try so that one is inviting, you see. So it's uh, it's a classic case of push marketing, buy, 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 or hey, come, let, let's give it a try. So I think as customers become smarter, as they become smarter, become more wary, uh, we businesses or even marketers must allow the prospects to experience what is it like first. What is it like to basically use your product before you actually go in for the sale? So the sale process has become even longer you had to give them a free trial before they actually buy something so the, that's where the marketer need to come in to basically be wary of how do you create that, that that's where terms like ux come in user experience yeah if that your app is sucky it won't even last five minutes on the phone <laughs> they were like uh crap man it's a shitty app they're just gonna delete it so you ask but whereas 10 20 uh i think Maybe 10 years ago when apps just came, you don't really bother how shitty it looks. If it does the work, it's good enough. But customers have become so much more sophisticated now. They would demand every app to look like Airbnb, smooth, easy to use. If it doesn't feel like Airbnb, man, it doesn't, it's, uh, then it doesn't stick. It won't stick on my phone for more than, I don't know, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, right. Okay. So then... I think that that leads to uh, a very poignant question. In your opinion, what are some of it that you've seen the most recently well-executed marketing efforts? And why do you think they work very well? Huh, well-executed marketing uh, mm -hmm. efforts. Uh, okay, like, uh, so when last year, uh, Zoom to most people, uh, Zoom had been around for like the longest time, but uh, to most, mm -hmm but it hasn't become a household name. Like uh, people would know what is WhatsApp and all that, but they wouldn't know Zoom, right? So when the uh, when the lockdown started, uh, families being apart, so they realized that, hey, uh, let's go on the Zoom call. Uh, and then after that, uh, so Zoom became a new concept. And for a period of time, Zoom actually offered, uh, I think, was it unlimited? Uh, they, they used to cap at 40 minutes if it's a group call. And then after that, it became unlimited. So they allow people to actually try how easy it is to actually use Zoom. And I think single-handedly, uh, I mean, a lot of things uh, happen as well during that time, but that's how Zoom became so uh, popular. Uh, mm. Even outside of those people, because don't forget, Zoom have always been a business-centric app. Uh, you wouldn't expect your mom or your grandma to be using Zoom like in 2019. Uh, you, uh, they will use FaceTime. FaceTime is a more commercial uh, yeah. for the for the consumers right uh, but right now zoom has become such a such a term so i think it was phil phil Levin, the uh, ever uh, the founder of evernote uh, was actually uh, he was actually asked like why uh, what what does he envision evernote to be and he he said that well if you look at uber uber has become a habit like the moment you are you want to leave the home you would take out the app and you would reach for uber yeah you want the right but uber has become such an integral part of it and for those of you who don't realize how integral part of it that he has been in your life 
try going to countries where there's actually no Uber, and then you realize that, wow, okay, that's, uh, that, that's how reliant you are on it. So like Google Maps to me, when I was in Sudan, uh, Sudan two, uh, two years ago, because there is, uh, uh, there's, I think it's embargo. Yeah, uh, so, so they don't really have uh, Google or Facebook over there, and there's no Google Maps over there. So the first mm -hmm. time when you take out Google Maps and you realize that shit is blank, and that's only you realize that that's where you realize that how much of a habit that you have, the, the reliance that you actually have on it. So it's same with Uber. So like Zoom have also reached to that level as well. So if you were to ask your they come on uh, Microsoft Teams or come on WebEx, they're like, huh, can can we just go on Zoom? So so I think in a way, mm -hmm. uh, last year itself uh, saw uh, Zoom becoming more uh, mainstream. So that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of uh, but of course, there are some, I wouldn't say they're opportunistic, but they were actually in the right position as well. I think uh, a lot of food delivery companies came up uh, last year uh, because during the lockdown uh, that everywhere, everyone is actually facing, right? For once, we were handicapped because whatever that was so easy, last time you can just drive the car out and buy something. But now when we are yeah. restricted, it, we, we are immediately look for uh, alternatives. Mm -hmm. So that's where, uh, but in terms of marketing that, that you that writes really well. I always love how Nando's uh, pull it off. Ready anytime when there's some interesting stuff that happen uh, on the news uh, within like a very short span of thirty minutes, and uh, they can basically create some post that that is that goes really viral because they are very good at spotting trends. That's number one, and number two, they they really understood their brand message really well. So they, uh, that's the, uh, and I think, I, I'm not sure, I haven't really spoken to them before, but I always suspected that they are, their marketing teams is very much in source. They don't work with the agency. The agency may execute it for them, but the idea came with him. So, uh, but Nando's have been a good marketing, uh, good in marketing, good at catching attention, even way before uh, the pandemic. So, so, so that I think that's one, another example that I can think of like right now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Malcolm yeah. Nando's, right, correct. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, speaking uh, speaking of uh, things popping up here and there, one of the other things we keep seeing popping up actually during the pandemic, which was really timely, was a lot of shows by Marvel. And as you brought up, the Marvel Cinematic Universe started yeah. all the way back in uh, 2008, and then it's become this, this juggernaut of a thing now. Do you think there are there are things there are some items that companies or people could learn about marketing from the way marvel has kind of done things okay uh okay because if you uh, yes marvel has become a juggernaut right now mainly because of disney as well uh mm -hmm. but they have made their fair share of uh mistakes along the way like mm -hmm. how how sony still owns uh spider-man's ass is because mm -hmm. uh and how fox uh own x-men but but now of course now uh, now Disney have to buy, have bought Fox yeah. over, right? Uh, so I think in the early days of the comics, uh, so where, okay, one thing I do realize where Marvel resonated with more people is because they create characters that are more relatable. Like, mm -hmm. like DC, okay, uh, Batman aside, uh, ultra, uh, other than being ultra rich, uh, then you have Superman who's technically an alien. Uh, mm -hmm then I realize a lot of people can't relate. Uh, they, they want to be Superman, but then they realize they can't relate because I'm not alien, right? So they, they, it, it took DC a couple of years to change the story back. It's like, do you feel that sometimes you are Superman where you are being alienated? Like you are not, you are being brought into a world that is uh, that is like different, uh, that is new and you are you are different from everybody else. So the, the introverts will start to kind of resonate with Superman, but Marvel actually started it way earlier. They created uh, characters with flaws, like Spider-Man, as awesome as he is, he's always like juggling uh, school. And for the longest time in comic book history, uh, Spider-Man has always been poor. So, so people can actually relate to that. Hey, man, this kid is smart. He is super strong, but he's still poor. It's like me. So they, they created a lot of characters. And uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark, for a long period of comic history, he he battles with alcoholism. So mm. what Stanley has done in that, that realm, right? And even X-Men. So X-Men, they are 
as a as a band, uh, it's always about racism. So the un un underlying tone has always been racism. <laughs> it, you know, so it, they have created stories, characters that people can relate to. So it took DC a while to basically catch up to to realize that they cannot create someone other than Batman that is very relatable. So that's why when Disney uh, saw what Marvel has done, because it's an identity, just like how they bought Star Wars, they are actually buying a community of, when they buy over the IP, they bought over the community. When they buy over the IP of Marvel, they bought over the community as well. So I think where, uh, I wouldn't say Marvel has done, uh, they, they have done really well, but the real, uh, I think the real smart, move at the back has actually been what Disney what Disney is trying to do is mm. consolidate almost like almost every every other franchise out there. Uh, I'm quite surprised they haven't started talks with Lego though. So because I think it totally makes sense if they buy Lego because with all the IPs that they have, uh, whoa, uh, it's just crazy. And talking about Lego, Lego have also bounced back uh, so much in the last 10 to 15 years because back then it's just normal bricks. And then when they start introducing you know, movie teams and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The only part that I thought they haven't really gone into is Japanese uh, anime or even J, J, J culture because mm -hmm. I think if they were to do Lego sets around Final, Fat uh, Final Fantasy characters or Final Fantasy world, you know, great world, world building franchises, right? Man, I think fans or even Gundam. So I think people would just line up to buy a Lego Gundam, for example. So, uh, so I thought the next physical thing that it would make sense for Disney to buy would actually be, <laughs> well, in a way, would be Lego. Like but they have become such a giant right? because almost every other brand that that you touch, you may actually it may actually be related to Lego uh, in a way. So I think for that, Stanley, I need to bring a point to Marvel. Stanley has always been one of the, uh, I think. Uh, 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 if you study his history as well, he wasn't uh, not exactly a creative person when he started, but I think he he was such a visionary in a way to create characters that people can relate. So if one thing we all can learn from Marvel, right? Okay, other than creating like cinematic right. universes and all that, is to basically right. create a product or service or a brand that the average Joe can relate to. If you come from a point where you know we are superior and stuff like this customers will not be able to relate as well but let's say you go down to their level and you elevate them and that's what marvel i think have done they they elevated uh you know uh, elevated the i guess the way we we look at things and one last thing as well if you really want to learn from the marvel cinematic universe do know that iron man have always been a b grade superhero before uh, before it became like mainstream, because back then nobody really wanted to become Iron Man. Everyone wanted to become uh, Spider Man or you know in the Marvel side. But what RDJ uh, Robert Downey Jr. did with Iron Man, so it's really the, the, how they kick started the whole thing is just fantastic. So that's why to look back at MCU, you have to really look back at what Stanley has done since the early days of Marvel, and it wasn't easy. They were selling, they were so broke and they were so close to bankruptcy so many times that they had to sell all these rights. And that's why today we have problems with Spider-Man. So uh, if anyone can just Google, how how did Sony get their hands on Spider-Man? Then you will know how, what the mistakes that Marvel have made along the way. But I think they rectify it as well. Uh. Yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question, but I'm just, uh, in a way, a comic book uh, enthusiast as well. So. No, I think I think I think you brought it home definitely at the end there. We've we've actually very true your timing impeccable nine on the dot and we are right into Q and A. We actually had one question, but we we already covered. It was about ah. um the good campaigns that you came across and then why did that work? But we I believe we already covered that. So while while we wait for anybody else that wants to maybe ask some questions about marketing, I actually wanted to ask you since you are an active marketer are there things that you are excited about that's coming up any anything at all wow um huh, interesting so okay so uh because recently face uh sorry apple with the latest ios version have stopped remarketing uh re retargeting so because of data mm. protection and all that and uh mm. google 
Chrome, I think the next couple of versions would exercise the same thing as well. So if so, I always wonder in a world where you cannot retarget customers who visit your mm -hmm. website, right? So uh, imagine like going to Lazada and um, putting that iPad case <clears throat> into your cart and you don't buy. And then suddenly everywhere you go, you go to YouTube, you go to Facebook, that iPad case kind of like follow you every day, everywhere. So that, that's the whole concept of retargeting. But to not be able to do that, uh, I would think marketers have to be way more uh, creative in the way they plant ideas. Because if I cannot retarget anymore, I must basically say something in such a succinct, punchy way that it plants a seed. Even if the customer don't buy it, right? every other things that I see will start triggering it. So if you ask me, storytelling would be... Uh, I think would be a great emphasis moving forward. And I think there was this TED talk as well that says that mm -hmm. while jobs are being replaced by machines, uh, creative uh, resources, which is that uh, people who are creative will actually be a commodity as well. They are actually lesser and lesser creative uh, people mm -hmm. around. Uh, and if you look back, back at the past 500 years, you can see like in, I wouldn't say we have that much of a great invention that really changed the way uh, you know uh, the humans actually have uh, evolved. But uh, but I think if you ask me, the best inventions in the last century uh, only two things: the toilet bowl, uh, how we flush the, our shit out of the house, and second is the paper clip. So you know the paper clip itself, and, and just look at something as simple as it, like the way it really changed. Uh, how humans behave, right? But other than that, it's, it's not creative, it's more innovative. Like, uh, I have a cup with a handle. So that's, that's a cup. And then the more I put two handles on it, it becomes like a mark in a way. So I, I wouldn't say it's a total new thing. So I think, I think it was also Will Smith who said that almost every, um, every question that you want to answer, someone else will have, will have already answered it. So I think that has also stopped in a way, people people stop becoming creative. If you think like, hey, if everything also already been created, right? So so why bother? Why not just follow the mm -hmm. crowd? So so I think if too many people were to believe that, the problem is that we will we will truly suffer from the lack of creativity. Uh, another point to look at, I think in the early seventies and eighties, there weren't that many personal development books like Seven Habits mm -hmm. of Highly Effective People or maybe uh, Think and Grow Rich. And yet, right now, there's a whole industry on personal development but if you look at in the early 70s and 80s right we have people like bill gates warren buffett uh billy joy mm -hmm. uh, a lot of great people do came up during that time somehow the proportion is not the same as now because if we have ten thousand more motivational or personal development books shouldn't there be ten thousand times more Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, which is, mm -hmm. which we, we don't, we don't see that actually. So I mm -hmm. think human, human beings to a certain degree, we perhaps have, I won't say we have degraded, but we have become a bit lazy in our thinking. Like a very common uh, thing you will see among kids today, even ourselves, like we would think, hey, why is the sky blue? Huh? Okay, you know what? Let me take out the phone and Google why is the sky blue? And after I read it and like, oh, okay, so that's why the sky is blue. After half an hour, if someone else were to ask me, hey, Merrick, do you know why the sky is blue? I, I seriously can't remember, I, but I remember how to get the answer. So the old days was that we would hoard knowledge in our head, but right now we just need to know how to get that knowledge. So even that itself is already a huge gap. So I, see, I would like to see how marketing tech would evolve based on that simple principle itself where we have so much information and the so much access to information it's not even so much information it's so much access to information uh mm -hmm. and how, how are we going to like use that to our advantage so i've always been interested in marketing attack in the areas of marketing so yeah right okay we have actually a couple of questions from scott from the, from oh, okay audience now yeah so scott wants to know what you think uh, is going to be the next generation leading a social media platform, maybe one of the existing ones or some something new akin to an evolution of VR chat, maybe? 
Yeah, could be that. Uh, actually, I would think what Clubhouse started, and then after after that, Spotify Green Room, and then there's Dive. Uh, it, audio has could be the next frontier because uh, it's bringing back the old days of radio, uh, which I which I always like. Uh, and then as people are commuting more, right? Because uh, they can't they, technically you can't watch something as you actually commuting. So so I think audio is actually one way. And one thing Clubhouse have always done that done did really well was democratize uh, relationships in a way. That, like for example, if I'm in the same room with Elon Musk, I can actually kind of like unmute myself and actually ask a question. Like, how else in the real world will I be able to do that? Right. So so I think audio will be the next uh, frontier. Uh, looking at where Spotify. Uh, Spotify probably would have predicted this because a couple of years ago, they actually made huge investments into podcasts. So they bought Gimlet Media, they bought another podcast company, two podcast creation companies. And I think Encore is, have been acquired by them as well. So, so I think they could have predicted, it's either they make a huge mistake mm-hmm. or I think they could have seen that audio could be the next frontier because if you look at videos, uh, so there's TikTok, there's micro videos from long form to micro videos, almost everything we have already covered. Uh, and yet audio, uh, one thing that podcasts can do where shorter formats can't is that you can actually deep dive into like really deep conversations. But can we deep dive over an interview like this? I mean, I mean, don't know. I've never done like a three hour visual interview before, <laughs> but I've heard podcasts that actually last that long. Tim Ferriss, for example, is famous for his three, four hour long form uh, podcast right and, and i think there's a certain crowd that will actually follow it so uh my best guess will actually be audio because everything that is visual had been done uh vr have you know uh, have, in a way has been done as well but if you go back but vr requires some form of higher tech access for mm-hmm. you to so, so then there's the whole alienation against like, oh man, I don't have the latest phones, I can't do this VR. But if you have a phone that can power Spotify, you can, and you just need a good headset, right? And basically you can, you, you can basically uh, enjoy podcasts or you can basically participate in the conversation in Clubhouse. So I think in a way you don't really need expensive equipment, whereas videos, you need bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth and, you know, uh, and uh, uh, for, for you to be able to have a nice, uh, chat like if you were to do this over a phone call, uh, then I don't know, by cutting off visual. I don't. I, I think my best answer to that. I, I love to be able to predict uh, the future, <laughs> but just looking at all the sensors, right? I thought audio would be one that is the most under underappreciated and underutilized right, right now. Yeah. Uh, is there any? I think, I think we have three more. Should be There's one enough. by Xiu Ping. Run huh? by Xu Ping. What is the best approach to recruit for an online community app, specifically for bootstrap startups? Uh, for online community app, huh? Okay, so if you were to follow the the steps of Facebook, then they will basically start niche like If you are not part of mm-hmm. this, if you're under eighteen, you can't use it. Uh, those kind of like limiters, uh, people will like it. Just like how uh, I think like how Clubhouse did with uh, only staying with iOS for almost a year. So that, because uh, anytime a brand, a new brand enters a market, like you attract and you engage, you see. So, so when Clubhouse started, a lot of people are like, uh, like, hey man, how come it's not available for Android users? So uh, it pieces a lot of people off, but at the same time, but, but by piecing, it's, piecing people off itself, it's already a trigger. The fact that they are triggered by it is because they are paying attention on the app, you see. So I think for community apps, a good place to start is to uh, to basically know who you are really, you, you want to be the first uh, pioneer you, or what uh, Bill Ole would say, your big hit market. Who, who do you want to like uh, conquer first, right? Like Amazon is a behemoth today, but they started off with books. PayPal is a behemoth today, but they started off targeting uh, internet marketers who couldn't get credit card facilities. So... Uh, so I think even for community apps, if you're targeting everyone, would be really tough. And in a world right now, we are—I think we are in the living in the age of great divide. In a way, like like between Trump and Biden, like if you listen to the Trump, the Biden's camp, 
Yeah, if if you you are just blank, you are just a Malaysian, and you just listen to what they say, it actually makes perfect sense. And then when you go over to Trump's camp and you just listen and you don't make any judgment, and you realize that hey, they actually make sense as well. So it's actually very hard for me to if I, I I'm in the middle, it's like I I can't vote, so people can't decide as much. So they are looking for a sense of belonging right now. Whoever that can make the most sense to me, I will follow. So for online community apps, if you can go niche, I think the future is also in niching uh, as well because I don't want general stuff anymore. I want something that's created for me. So like for Supreme Skills, I mean, I don't know what uh, community you are building, but look for something, uh, a group that's more vocal, uh, that's, then they will be your advocates because I've also mm. started communities before. If you find the right advocates at the start, they will sing the song for you. They will basically propagate. Uh, that's, that's how propaganda came, came around, propagate. Right? How, how do you propagate? Uh, then they will propagate the message and ask their friends to come. Because uh, especially right now, uh, so I think Daniel Cervantes, who is uh, the uh, co-founder of Telex KL as well. So we, we actually were having a quick chat on community building because uh, we realized that in history, whenever there are tough times, people come together a lot easier. And mm. even, I think even a, uh, movies understood it, directors understood it, because Russia could be fighting America versus China. But the moment the alien spaceship appear, oh, fuck it, man, let's just come together and combine all our nukes and uh, blast the shit out of it and enjoy a short moment of peace before we start fighting each other again. So I think in like what COVID has done for us is that it has created ways for us to, the, the sense of belonging. Like we, we, we crave for the connection more than anything else. So for Siu Ping's case, if let's say you can create a community, a, a platform where people can come together and just meet like-minded people, never in history would it be easier, like, during, especially during the tough times. So even as obscure as it is, there will be interest uh, because right now, internet is basically the... Uh, you, you can basically look for that weirdo in every village right now. Because back then, our parents had to conform. Because if they come up with a weird idea, they're going to be alienated immediately. So uh, perhaps in your case, you think if you can look for all the... Those who have been... What's the community that's the most alienated? If you can build... If you can allow them to communicate on that app, that will be key. Lah. Discord with gamers, for example. So this guy has always been like a gamers to uh, cryptocurrency guys have always gone to Telegram in a way. Somehow there's always a, a gravitational pull to different platforms uh, depending on what uh, industry or what topic you're talking about. Yeah. Mm. Hope that helps, you think. Uh, Scott has a question. Any marketing books? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, for me, I don't read as much, but when it comes to books, uh, they really... Uh, there, there are a couple of frameworks that are interesting. So I think uh, Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Swartz, that's like a classic one. But the what to look out for in there is the market sophistication, the five levels of market sophistication. I always believe that there are two triangles in marketing that if you can understand these two triangles, you can probably understand 80% of marketing. So the five levels of market sophistication, that's Eugene Swartz uh, in uh, Breakthrough Advertising. And then Chad Holmes. Chad Holmes wrote a book, uh, The Ultimate Sales Machine, 2005, I think. Uh, inside, there's a pyramid as well. That's called the Demand Generation Pyramid. So uh, if you, uh, these two books, I always kind of like recommend uh, if they want, kind of want to study marketing, right? And then when it comes to podcasts, uh, I'll be honest, I don't have any preference towards uh, podcasts. But having said that, in terms of, because I always believe the next generation of good marketers would be the greatest storytellers. So of late, I've been following uh, Conan O'Brien's uh, podcast. Conan O'Brien needs a friend. Like if you want to look for a great episode to start with, I thought the one that he did with Barack Obama, that one was interesting because when you see, uh, yes, Conan, Conan has always been a comedian, but I thought his insights, and he's pretty much a smart guy. His IQ is like above 180. So the way he he can dig out the stories from people, right? So I think if we can learn that skill of how he can gravitate or how he can like uh, kind of like gel with the other person that's interviewing, that's something that you don't see 
uh, very often. And that itself will be a commodity because I've seen so many hosts and interviewers, they will just ask questions that they have prepared. Uh, they are not going in there as a conversationalist. They, they don't go there to start a conversation. So I always believe, so this one, my, a good friend of mine, Richard Lefebvre, told me this before, a uh, good and maybe that answers your question as well, Scott, why I think audio is the next best thing. Because the greatest radio shows, even back then, you, it's like you are the fly on the wall. Like you're not part of the audience, but you are just there and you're just listening. The, the good, a good metaphor could be you heard an interesting conversation at a cafe. You, you're not part of the conversation, but you're, you're just somehow pulled in. You're not the audience, but you are unintentionally drawn into it. So if marketers can learn that style of copywriting right, or that style of communicating that people who are not supposed to be listening in, they are listening in, are listening in, I think that could be the next, uh, the, the next level up skill uh, that, uh, that marketers can actually learn. Because digital, like last year, you said it before, suddenly everyone can become a digital marketer, right? But I haven't seen many people who suddenly become a storyteller. So that is still a skill that requires uh, time. Some, some skills you can microwave it. I think some skills you have just have to slow cook it. So I think storytelling. Uh, so marketers who are not so good at the digital front, instead of chasing to be more digital, maybe you can look back at fundamentally what drives humanity forward. And I think stories have always been there. The Bible, religion, uh, if you look at what's the greatest medium of transferring uh, st uh, knowledge from one generation to another has always been storytelling. So that audio and storytelling, that's probably the two areas that I, I will kind of like bet my money on. Mm. We have one last one. It's from Sonia Paul. She's asking, besides marketing strategies and techniques, what value or principle do you hold dear to your heart in producing successful marketing while maintaining integrity? Whoa. Okay, that's a tough. Do well, maintaining, you... yeah, yeah. Uh, you see, um, the, the toughest uh, challenge is that clients engage us because we move products off the shelf. I mean, that, that's what the marketer is supposed to do. It's supposed to create. But the, the constant question that I will ask myself is, how much is enough? Mm. How much is enough? Like, like we would basically ask consumers to buy things that they don't need to prepare them for a day that may not come or, you know, or yeah, to change things that is not necessary. Like we, we used to remember phones can last you like two or three years. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest, phones can still last you two or three years. There's, there's nothing wrong. Technology has, has always been good. But, but I think it's marketers' fault to basically say that, oh, if you're using iPhone, wait, now it's 13, right? Okay. If you're using iPhone 12, man, you, you are losing out because now it's the, now it's the 13th generation right mm -hmm. now. So, so I, I think, yes, marketers are at play. So if you ask me what is keeping us what can keep us our, our true compass north is first do we have a moral uh, i won't say a moral code but do we look at the repercussions the repercussions of what we are doing or what we are saying mm. by like for example uh, by asking our customers to be more individualistic to be more vocal about your voice yes we are making them more brave more bold but what if the person is an idiot who is spreading the wrong gospel. We have just empowered someone uh, to start a cult, you see? So, uh, but of course, they, they always say that, hey, man, you can just give the person a sword. They can use to defend and they can use to, uh, you know, use to attack, right? But for, I don't know, because I used to be a monk before. So I always thought that, yeah, but could there be a world where I don't even need to give you that sword in the first place? Can, can, we, can we work on that? So yes, I know it's very idealistic. In the materialistic world that we are in right now, me, they will probably think that I'm naive, but it's true because the cost of, okay, textile industry, that's something simple to look at. Uh, how much marketers have kind of like fucked it up. The cost of recycling clothes, 
mm. is actually more expensive than producing it right now. Like, which is kind of weird. Like, if the, the if I throw this shirt away, the cost to recycle it is actually more expensive than the cost that I bought it from. Why? Because we have created so much of demand. Like, oh, if you like this shirt, you buy, you know, buy more, buy more. That's why if you look at, I think Maria Kondo came in at the right time because whatever doesn't spark joy, you remove it. And we realized that our wardrobe, we only wear like 15%. The other 85%, we don't even touch. Like women, for example, I'm sorry, ladies for who, who listen in. You, you have this special nightgown that you will put there and that, you know what, one special night, I'm going to wear it. And truth be told, when that special night came around, you went out and bought and bought a new one. So, so that's where that's why I have I, I've seen garage sales or people selling stuff where the clothes that they buy, the tax are still on, is still in the same plastic. And I will question, then why do you buy it in the first place? Oh, because it was cheap and I may need it for later. And who told you that? A salesperson or a marketer? So that's so you see the repercussions we have to realize. But what if we are in the if let's say everyone's already cons- uh okay? Another example I can give you is information. There are so many people who are paralyzed. They, they, we call them analysis paralysis because oh, we want to know enough before starting a business. Mm-hmm. Truth be told, there's never enough to start a business. You you, yeah. you can learn everything. I, I don't see that many business professors starting businesses because. I think they know the most. And yet, the more they know, they actually do not start. <laughs> so, so there's this, the fear of missing out or the, or the uh, in a way, the, the fear of not being part of it is like, oh, I need to know enough. So, but marketers are always feeding you because, hey, you need to read this book. You need to uh, listen to this audio program. You need to buy this course on Udemy. You need to get all this thing before you can start uh, because we don't want you to make any mistakes. But mm-hmm. what if mistakes are the way moving forward. What if mm-hmm. the fear of making mistakes itself I actually start us from this. So uh, maybe I can end with this story as well. So I have a friend who uh, who kind of inherited shitloads of money when the, when the auntie uh, aunt passed away. So, and for the last five, almost 10 years, he once he got the money, he did not work. He literally mm-hmm. just stayed at home, watch TV, wake up and stuff like this. So, so we were like, asking him, so, so did you like travel? You know, you're trying. No, nah, because if I go, you know, people will rob me and stuff like that. I'm like, wow, in a in a gift that your your aunt would have wanted you to live a really good life by giving you the money. But in the process of her giving you that gift, she has actually robbed the very same thing that she intended you to become. Because you have so much fear that people would kidnap you or rob you right now that you don't even leave the home. So yeah, so so those are the things that uh so I think a lot, but I think the aunt gave the intention was very good. Just mm-hmm. like how all marketers we justify that what we are doing is good, but <laughs> do we really take one or two steps further? Uh think one or two steps further because uh we know global warming or we uh, you know or all this stuff that's happening on the global scale, and yet we are yeah. still asking people to to buy. That's why there are kids who would uh who will eat, who will not eat, who will starve just to get the latest iPhone. Uh, mm. at, at what point do we do we stop we, that we tell them that hey, it's actually okay to not have an iPhone? It's actually okay if you don't even have a phone or a phone plan. So I, I don't see a lot of marketers doing that uh, to basically say that hey, it's actually okay if you wear a black shirt every day. Uh, yeah, uh, minimalist in a way. <laughs> right. Well, okay. I Definition think, uh, of value. Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. Somehow I, I realized it's gone very philosophical. So it's uh, okay. But, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's the startup grind. It's not startup. It's just become too grounded in a way. I think most people will be like in a space where man, I never look at marketing from <laughs> from such a philosophically <laughs> uh, angle. But but I think I'll end with this as well. It's like I think even if you don't do marketing, any technology that you create, there is an impact there is an impact to the things that we do today and but i think marketers have a have a bigger responsibility because we have the ability to influence we 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 know we have the skill to to plant ideas uh christopher nolan may have created inception like 10 years ago 
But I think markets have been doing that uh, for the longest time, you see. Like, sometimes we don't even... I think customers buy things em so emotionally right now, there's no logical reason behind it anymore. Like, when you ask them, hey, can I know why you buy that thing? And they're like, they, they can't give you a logical answer anymore. So I always... Uh, it's not... I, I don't think it's my place to take all the responsibility, but I... I I know for a strong fact that marketers have, our hands are dirty. Lah. We have, we have caused this social downfall and uh, we, we kind of need to use it to uh, hopefully recover it somehow. Yeah. Slowly, slowly. We will, we will yep. be good. Awareness before change, right? So it's like, well, at least you're yes. aware right now. You tell the client, hey, you know, Mr. Client, just, just 5,000 a month, Facebook ads should be enough. Don't, don't, don't spend 10,000, you know, you don't want to overspend <laughs> But then again, the client will fire you after that, right? So, yeah, may not be the best idea, actually, to have balance. Balance. No, balance. we are in the age of materialism. Like, we, are, we, are, we, would, we would do things to gain a hit at the expense of others. So, Trump is a good example of that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we I should end, end we, when it becomes we, too political. Yes, before we go into dangerous conversations that we should take off recording <laughs> I, of course, I think of course. Uh, we we actually always end our sessions with a bit of a rapid fire okay so oh, i sure, have man. some rapid fire questions that i prepared for you just the first one that comes to mind out of the questions that i give you and then we can say our closing statement so maverick if you're ready to go here it is marketing mad science rapid fire Maverick, would you rather have dark or white chocolate? Dark. Would you rather eat cheesecake or fruitcake? Cheese. Time travel is invented and quickly becomes the number one choice for holidays. Do you travel to the past or to the future? Wow. Okay. Logically, I will go to the future, but emotionally, I will go to the past, actually. Okay. Marvel has cast you into one of their movies. Do you choose to become a fan-favorite supporting character or a great villain? A great villain. Okay. Now, a bit more open-ended. Pandemic is over. Where's the first place you're traveling to for your next holiday? Oh, shit, man. Everybody asked that. Okay, I'm sorry. I will probably pick Taiwan because, okay. and I have a very good reason, because I did half of Taiwan before the pandemic and I was supposed <laughs> to do it. Like, it's like hanging. If let's say I were to die tomorrow, I would tell, hey God, can you like, ah, <laughs> maybe I, I need to finish the other half. So, because it somehow feel uh, incomplete, <laughs> you see. So, right. yeah, so I'll basically, I'll, I'll technically pick uh, Taiwan. Yes, the bottom half of Taiwan, like Kaohsiung and yeah. The last one. You are allowed to have one of the infinity stones in real life. Which one do you choose? Time. Time stone. Because uh, I'm willing to bet uh, Dr. Stri yeah, but then again, he has already given up his time stone, right? But I always think that he's going to be the next leader of phase four or MCU uh, for a very simple reason. Because he has the same beard ah. as... Iron Man, so yeah. So I'll pick the time stone because that one, uh, because of all the stones, I think that one was okay. That that then it will mean Black Widow's death will be. Uh, but I think it was the hardest for Doctor Strange to actually give it up. So I always, I always felt that the time stone is like the most critical one. Yeah. So the time stone, green one for me. Okay. Okay. With what, that, what, what happens if you ask that question to someone who like who's not a Marvel fan? Oh, no, 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 no. I picked the question for, for you. I, I, I chose the question. Okay. I wouldn't ask. <laughs> Without because if you were to ask terrible. some people, they'll be like, yes, what? terrible. What? Absolutely What's terrible. So <laughs> Without, Without context, that would have been awful. But now, before, before we, we dismiss everybody and stop our recording, if okay, somebody sure. wants, they had such a good time and they wanted to get more of you, where, where do they find you? Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, LinkedIn, lay it on us. How do they get in touch? Oh, I think uh, I think LinkedIn will probably be the best place. Uh, so just look for me or 
me see whether oh yeah i have a link where i can type it in so uh facebook i don't know but facebook somehow has a lot of bad news that sometimes i get very negatively affected when i go to, I, I hate myself more after going to facebook so sorry mark but <laughs> But somehow LinkedIn people tend to like control what they say. So even if they want to say something shitty, they would they would they would, they would put some perspective into the shittiness, right? But on somehow on Facebook, if they want to shit, they just shit like that. And I thought, wow, okay. So liberal media, right? All right. With that, everybody, uh, help help join me in a virtual round of applause for our guests. Maverick, thank you for being here today for our marketing mad science session. I hope everybody got some insights from, from the discussion. And if you do have anything further or you think Maverick is a stand-up guy and you want to follow him, please do. I can personally attest all his workshops and content is fire. So please do give him a follow and, and keep up. And with that, I think uh, we can call it a night. When, if we have Maverick back next year, hopefully sometime, Please be sure to join again. Right? Yeah, I don't know. It's so, Sarawak, right? right? If I can fly, yes. fly yes. over to East Malaysia, why not? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, guys, um, stay safe, stay safe, and stay awesome.